Hey guys, my name is Blake. I'm a 4-H extension specialist at the University of Kentucky and I work in the entomology department. What we're going to talk about on this video is uh, some of the ways to get started on a 4-H pinned insect collection. So this is where you actually go outside, collect bugs, and pin and identify them and uh, submit them to county and state fair. Um, we're very interested in doing this video and sharing this information right now because we know that several of the counties have been um, sharing uh, kits uh, of the, some of the supplies that you need to get started with a 4-H insect collection. So that's we really want to support that right now. So what you're seeing here, this is a, 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 way, to, a way to shoot videos that's called a desktop recording. So you're seeing my face and I'll also be able to show you stuff like PowerPoints and web pages and I'll be able to bring up uh, materials to the camera and show them to you as well. So let's get started with the PowerPoint here and I'll be moving some of these things around as we go. I'm going to make my face a little bit smaller for now and then I might increase it a little bit later. Um, but that's what this is all about. You see a picture there of pinned insects and they're inside a box. They're kind of pinned into styrofoam and they have little labels around them. This is what a 4-H pinned insect collection is all about. Um, this is a collection that has existed for many years um, and it's a great way uh, if you are someone who wants to go outside and do a project that doesn't necessarily involve working with a whole lot of other people in this age of social distancing, this is something that you can do pretty much on your own or with a small family group. So it's a great project for right now. Um, down on the bottom of the screen here, you'll see my name, um, 4-H Entomology, that's what I do, and then my email address. Please send any questions that you have about this. This is just going to be an introduction. Uh, to really learn this stuff, you kind of need about a, a half-day workshop to do it. Um, but you can get started without all that information, just with just with a few a few things that you uh, that you might need to get started. Um, uh, and that email address can uh, we can help you with both questions, where to find materials, and also with identification. I really want to stress that one of the, one of the things about this project is you have to identify the bugs to to which scientific order they belong to. It's actually not very hard, and most 4-H'ers pick up on it pretty quick. But if you're not quite sure send me pictures over that email address and I'll show you that email address again at the end and re-emphasize that but we what we don't want is for people to uh, either either youth or leaders and parents to not want to get into this project because they're not confident about the insect ID the insect ID is just one part of this and really um, uh, not that difficult so um, just as an introduction, we're talking about 4-H county and state fair insect collections. These are projects that you can submit um, to your county or, or so you can submit for county fair and then the winners can go on to state fair. There's two different kinds of insect collections that you can do. You can either do a pinned insect collection, which is what this, this video is all about, where you physically go outside, catch insects and pin and identify them. or we've added a new option called a photo insect collection. It has a lot of the same rules and requirements as the pin collection, but you do it all through photographs. The photo collection is new. It's only been around for a couple of years. Um, there's pros and cons to both of these. The pin collection is really good because 4-H'ers learn the same techniques for pinning and identifying insects as graduate students, and even professionals use. They use actually the same materials, and we'll show you some of those in a minute. Um, and it's also a kind of collection that we've been doing for um, nearly 100 years with 4-H. So it's a classic collection, and really working with those physical insects up close is one of the best ways to learn about them. But um, in this new age of uh, cell phones that can take amazing photographs, we have also opened this collection up to a photography option. So kids who are maybe uncomfortable with touching insects or who don't want to kill insects, which is understandable, can do a very similar project using photos. Now this video, this particular video, is not going to be focusing on the photo collection. That's going to be, we're going to do a different video on that, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And so speaking of the difference between pinned insect collections and the photography insect collection, um, one of the differences is that you have to kill insects for the pinned collection. And some people just don't feel comfortable doing that. And like we said, that's why we created the photography option. 
And a legitimate question that we get is, is it bad to kill insects for a pinned insect collection? And it's a really good question, and it's something that you just have to kind of decide for yourself. But one thing that we'd like you to think about is that when you do kill insects for a pinned insect collection, you're doing so for education. When these insects die and you get up close with them, you can really learn about how their bodies work and how to identify the different types. And it also uh, handling these specimens uh, sometimes helps people get over um, the anxiety they might have about insects. Um, but yes, the insects do have to die for the collection. But um, just to put it in perspective, think about how many insects you might kill over one year to create a 4-H insect collection. Uh, some, of, some of the 4-H insect collections first year might have 50 insects and then second year would have more insects and so forth. Let's say you kill 100 insects a year for your collection. And let's go even further out there and let's say you've just collected a whole bunch that year and let's say you've killed and collected 1,000 insects. So that sounds like a whole lot. But think about this. Think about mowing your lawn just one time and how many insects die uh, from mowing the lawn. Um, a square foot of lawn might have hundreds of insects in it. So you might be killing a few hundred insects a second, little things like ants and aphids and flies and spiders. So insects die all the time and humans cause them to die all the time. But most of these ones that are dying from mowing the lawn or from accidentally running into them in your car, they die for no other purpose uh, than just to than just to say that your lawn needs to be mowed um, every few days. Um, but the ones that die uh, for these projects uh, at least are teaching us something and helps us to um, learn how to appreciate insects. So I'm not going to tell you that whether it's right or wrong to kill them for this project, but um, that is something to keep in mind. What we really want people to do with this is get started. Um, you don't need a whole lot to get started. Mainly all you need is a sunny day and a, and a cup with a lid on it. And then you can worry about all the other stuff later. But we're going to show you, we're going to introduce you with all the things and all the resources that you need to get started here on this video. So the first thing I want to let you know about is our resource page. Um, we have a resource page on our main entomology website um, that has uh, the stuff that you need uh, to get going. We've got some guides that talk about how to collect. We've got some guides that talk about identification that specifically focus on insect orders. We've got copies of the state fair judging sheets. That's handy because it shows you where the points come from. So any state fair project gets judged on points and you earn and lose points depending on the quality of your project. So the same thing is true with an insect collection. So you can see all those judging sheets. And then we have some other links as well. So let me show you that resource page. It is right here. I'll try to show you. There's the web address up there. You can also find it, if you don't feel like typing in the web address, if you just go to Google and type in Kentucky 4-H Entomology, it'll probably take you straight to it. The very first thing on this page is the State Fair Insect Collections. There's a link to a guide. I'll show you that guide in a few minutes. This is about a 20-page guide that talks about how to collect insects. Here's some stuff about the photography option. It's got its own guide. And then there's also an order key. Um, this project a lot of this project is about collecting insects and identifying which order they belong to. We've developed a key um, that talks about the insect orders. It's, um, it has a dichotomous key that allows you to look at your creature and answer questions about it. And it also just has some basic descriptions. We'll show, I'll show you that in a minute. There's also Florida worked with us. The University of Florida created an online version of this same PDF, but it's an interactive online key. So that's linked here. And what this does is it, um, it asks you questions about your bug. So you go here down to online identification key and you start with your bug and ask you questions. It says, does it have three pair of legs or does it have four or, more, four or more pair of legs? So you select three pairs of legs and it asks you more and more questions. So we really want you to use that tool if you can. And then down here, there's also a lot of tools for, um, for the agents and leaders, especially these scoring sheets for all the different, um, all the different classes and lots. Um, this video is mainly focusing on the first year collection, but we've got all the score sheets and rules for all the other years as well. Um, the materials that we're talking about today, um, the best place to get most of this stuff is a place called BioQuip, but um, uh, your, um, your agents will have a lot of this stuff right now too. We're trying to supply some of the agents with these things. 
so the pins and the boxes. So that's what our resource page has on it. Let me bring this up again. But the main materials that you need to get started is actually pretty simple. You need a collecting cup or jar. I'm gonna make my face just a little bit bigger over here so you can see some of this stuff. You need a collecting jar with some kind of a lid on it. A peanut butter jar is really good. Something plastic that has a lid that you can either screw on or snap on. You can also, um, sometimes if I don't have enough peanut butter jars, I'll go buy these at uh, the grocery store. These little Tupperware things with screw up, screw top lids. A deeper jar is a little better, but these work okay too. Um, what I'll usually do when I'm out with a group of kids is I'll bring a big plastic bag full of like dozens of these cups with lids because we'll need a lot of them. I'll explain why in a minute. The other thing you'll need is a freezer. So the main trick with this collection is you've got a cup, you see a bug that's walking around on a leaf, put it in the cup. Now you've got your bug, but it's alive. See, these bugs need to be dead before they can be pinned. So we take them back and put them in the freezer uh, for 24 hours. So you need access to a freezer. Um, then you need documents. We'll talk about um, what some of these documents are. And you can print these right off of that resource page I just showed you. This is the guide to insect collecting and state fair, in state fair projects specifically for pinned insects. It talks all about how to get started. So a lot of the same stuff that's in this video. It talks about how to make um, how to make the jars that you need, how to freeze insects. Then it'll talk about how to pin the insects. I'm gonna try to create a separate video because um, uh, the, this setup might not be good for showing how to pin, pin insects. We need sort of up close for that. I'm gonna try to do a separate video that I hope to um, have a link for at the end of this video. It shows how to pin the insects, how to label them, and all the other different things that you need to do for this project. So we really encourage you to, to print one of these for each youth, that's, uh, each 4 h -er that's gonna be doing this. There's also this document, that's the, um, the guide to insect orders. This is the thing we just showed you, the, the, the Florida website. This is the paper version of that same thing. It shows you some basic insect anatomy, and then it has this key. So this, the, the, the thing where Florida was asking you those questions, it showed the two pictures and it asked you a question. This is the paper version of that. It's a little more difficult to use. We encourage you to use the online version if you can. But one thing that this document has that's really useful is in the back, starting about page nine, it goes through each of the insect orders. So we can sort of see over here, this is page nine. So a lot of times I'll skip the key and go straight to page nine. There's about 25 insect orders, and most of them are pretty easy to identify. So when you've got a bug, start reading through these. It gives you the name of the order and it shows you some pictures and it describes them. And um, that will sometimes help you to quickly identify the order. So you need those documents. You also need these two things. These are the labels that you're going to print off and cut out. And these will go on pins that go um, in the box with your bugs. One thing that's important about these is they need to be printed on cardstock. Talk to your agent about that or places like um, uh, the, the FedEx stores can help you print things on cardstock. And these need to be on cardstock because they actually get put through um, insect pins and they need to be a little bit tough. But these are the, um, are the little forms that you'll need um, to, put on, to put on the insects. Then you'll also need um, insect pins and um, boxes. Let me show you a little bit about what insect pins are. So for, in, for pinning insects, we don't use the same kind of pins that you use for sewing. Hopefully you can see these here. Maybe I'll try to get a white background. They look kind of like sewing pins, but they're black. They're painted with black paint. That's to make them um, resistant to rust. So insects are wet when you first put the pins through them. And this helps to keep those pins from rusting. Um, these pins are very flexible, so they're very good for push, putting through an insect. Um, so your agents will hopefully have these pins. And if not, um, uh, we can talk about how to get those. And then uh, you'll have your box. So let me show you what your box will look like. A box is just a white cardboard box. I'm trying to get it in the camera here. It's very simple. Um, one of the things that we 
we want to encourage or we want to, we want people to understand is this box isn't just a play or a pretend box that we use just for 4-H. Um, this is the same kind of box that professional entomologists use to store insects and also to mail insects or to ship them through the mail. So they're very tough. That's why we like to use them with 4-H because they're tough as they get moved around and jostled around. So this is what a complete insect collection looks like. This is about 25 insects. The first year insect collection needs to have between 25 and 50 insects with a minimum of four insect orders represented. So this box has, and the orders are at the tops of the columns here. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven orders and about 25 insects. So this is how, what a complete first year collection will kind of look like. So those are some of your materials. Some optional materials that you can use that you don't have to have. By the way, I just want to back up again. The most important materials to get started is just the plastic lid and the jar. That's all you really need to get started with in a freezer. The other stuff you can get later. Collect the bugs now and get the other stuff later. Once you put a bug in the freezer, it's good in the freezer for, for many, many weeks. Eventually it dries out after a few months and you can rehydrate it, but the, but the best way is to, is to pin them within a few weeks. But that gives you a few weeks to, to get these other materials together. But if it's a nice day, go ahead out now. It's a, we're already having some nice days in Kentucky. Go ahead now with your plastic jar and lid, catch the bugs and bring them to the freezer. That's the most important step, is to go outside. Some optional materials that you can, eat, that you can have. Um, you can get something called an insect net or a butterfly net. You can get these off of Amazon. A lot of these other materials, um, especially the white box, this is really only available either from us or from bioquick.com. Insect pins, you can get decent ones off of Amazon. Um, actually, the, the ones on Amazon are very good. I would encourage you to get maybe size two, three, or four. It'll ask you what size you want when you buy them. Um, the ones we give you through 4-H are size four. Um, there's lots of different sizes. I like size uh, two, three, and four the best. Um, the size doesn't have anything to do with how long they are. It has to do with um, how wide or how thick they are. It's for different sizes of insects. So a big beetle, you would need like a size four pin, but a little something smaller, like a little um, a little fly, you might use a size two. So we like to have multiple sizes of pins if you can get them. But some optional materials. Um, Butterfly net. You don't have to have this, but this is really good for, for um, catching things that are, are fly so fast that it's hard to get them with just the lid, the cup and the lid by themselves. Um, you almost can't catch dragonflies, for instance, without one of these. So these are really good for collecting dragonflies. This is also handy for um, bees and wasps because you don't want to get yourself stung. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you the technique that we use for a bee or a wasp. If you have I'm going to angle my screen down a little bit. If you have, a, if you say you have a bee crawling around on this thing, let's say this is a, a tree or a, or a leaf or a flower on the ground, instead of trying to use another cup like this to grab it, you could use a net. And the way that we do this is we know that insects like to fly upwards. These nets are nice because you, the sun goes through them, so they don't make much of a shadow. Shadows scare bugs away. So if we come down from the top with the net and go down, the bee or the wasp will fly up. Then we can kind of drop it onto the edge. Now the bee is trapped in here. Then we can take our cup, and an adult can help with this also. And you can sort of slowly work your cup up into here, keeping it keeping the, the bee or the wasp up. It'll keep flying up instead of out most of the time. So you can work your lid up. You can work your cup up through here. Get the bee or the wasp trapped in the top. Cap it like this until you're, until you're sort of ready. And then sort of work it this way until you get to the edge. So work it down through here. And then when you get to the edge, you slip it off of there with the lid on and you can a lot of times catch your bee or wasp without having to worry about getting stung. So that's a, an optional piece of material. Another thing that's nice to have 
is butterfly envelopes. You can get these off Amazon as well. These are little, um, they're also called glassine envelopes if you can't find them under butterfly envelopes. They're used for pressing flowers and they're used for collecting butterflies. These are really good because when you collect a butterfly and try to put it in a, in a, uh, a jar like this, they'll tend to try to escape and they'll hurt their own wings. So with a, a butterfly envelope, and when you buy these, a lot of times come in a pack of 100, which is it's good to have that and doesn't usually doesn't cost very much. It might be $10 or less or $15 for a pack of 100. So you get a bunch of these, carry them with you when you're out collecting. Then when you get your butterfly trapped in the net, you can kind of reach in and grab the butterfly by its body and actually fold its wings up a little bit. Take it out with the wings folded up and put it still alive inside the envelope so that it won't hurt itself. Then you can put this straight into the freezer and then it will be ready uh, to pin later. So butterfly sleeves are a really good thing to have with you. And then also just bring even more uh, jars and lids. Oh, and one thing I'm just gonna go grab very quickly. Something called a pinning board. This is another optional thing that I forgot to list, but we really like these. You can get these off of BioQuip. Um, they're just a piece of styrofoam with, with things gouged into them. And this allows you to, when you have a pinned insect, let's say this is a pinned insect, you put its, you put its body here and it allows you to spread their wings out. Um, the, the guide uh, talks how to, about how to use this. This is a nice tool to have because when you pin your insects, you will sometimes want to fold their wings down, especially if it's a butterfly, and their wings will dry in place. It takes a few days to do that. And a pinning board is a good tool to have. You can make your own one of these, though. You don't have to get this off of, um, off of BioQuip. You need kind of thick styrofoam. This is about two inches thick, so two or three inches thick would be great. And then with the help of somebody who has a very sharp knife or razor blade, you can cut out gouges and you can make your own. So you don't have to buy these. I like to buy them. These are really not, if you buy up, if you buy them in bulk, they're not very expensive, but they can be maybe a little more challenging to get if you're just trying to buy one or two of them. So a, um, a uh, uh, pinning board is a really good thing to have. In fact, I'm even gonna go ahead and add that in here. A pinning board styrofoam and regular, just regular styrofoam, um, like I said, can be used to make that. So those are some uh, some of the supplies that you'll need. And then how to collect. So we've talked a little bit about this, but the main thing is to go outside. You wanna pick a place where there's gonna be a lot of insects buzzing around. Um, what I've shown here is a picture of kind of the edge of a pond where there's some flowers and weeds and maybe some trees and a lot of sunshine. That's gonna be one of the very best places to go and find a lot of insects. You wanna go on a nice warm day uh, May and June are probably the very best months to collect, and then July, August, and September are also really good times to collect. Um, gardens, meadows, um, the edges of the forest or inside the forest are all good places to collect. Uh, one of my very favorite places, though, is the edge of a pond with a lot of weeds and stuff because um, you'll find so many different things there. Um, the, the weeds that are growing around a barn are a great place to look. Um, some safety considerations. I don't have this written on the um, on the PowerPoint because safety considerations for collecting bugs is really no different from the safety considerations of just being outdoors um, because there's no real additional risk to you here except when you're collecting bees and wasps. So when you're outdoors, bees and wasps are out there already. And when you're collecting them, at the very least, you're looking at it and you know where it is. So a bee where you know where it is is less dangerous than one where you don't know where it is. But just be careful because collecting bees and wasps can be dangerous for people who have um, allergies uh, or sensitivity to bee or wasp stings. Really otherwise, as far as safety, there's, there's no safety considerations here other than just the usual things for being outside. You know, bring your sunscreen, wear the right kind of shoes and that kind of thing. So go outside and be safe. Bring your jar and lid. Bring a lot of jars and lids. I, like I said, I bring a tr trash bag full of jars and lids because what you'll find is you'll catch one or two bugs and then as you take the lid off the next time, they'll escape because they're still alive. So you catch one or two, put the jar away and then get another jar that's ready to go. Another trick that you can do to help minimize them escaping is before you bring your jars with you, you can bring some paper, you can take some paper towel like this, rip it into sort of medium sized pieces and stick that in your jar and um, 
then any bugs that you put in there, it'll make them a little less likely to, to escape because they're gonna be crawling around inside this paper. They can still escape if you're not careful, but it makes them a little less likely to escape. And if you don't have paper towels, and you, if, you, if you're outside and you realize you forgot your paper towels, you can just grab some leaves and throw those in there as well. Like especially dead dry leaves would be a really great thing to, to throw in there. So bring jars and lids and a little bit of paper towel is really good. Then start catching bugs. Like I said, the, with a jar and a lid, you can just catch things by seeing a beetle walking around on the edge of a flower or a leaf. Just go up to that, angle my thing down here again. If there's a beetle right here crawling around, you just scoop it right up and you've got it in there trapped. And then you take it back and put it in the freezer. Or like I said, you can use your insect net if you have one of those. So bring them back to the, to the freezer. Freeze the bugs for at least 24 hours to make sure that they're, that they're dead. If you catch something, especially some of our very tough paper wasps and carpenter bees, those can actually survive in the freezer for a few hours. So you'll put them in there, you'll take them out, let's say two hours later, you'll think they'll be dead and you'll be ready to pin them. And then they will still be alive. They'll unfreeze and they'll start flying around and could potentially sting you if it's something like a wasp or a bee. But if you keep them in there for 24 hours, uh, they'll be dead and you can take them out, let them thaw out, and then they'll be ready to pin. Like I said earlier, uh, it's okay to leave bugs in the freezer for a while and they'll still be sort of fresh, but as you know with anything else that you put in the freezer, like frozen vegetables or frozen meat, it starts to dry out and get um, just crumble after a while. And so bugs can do that too. Um, the rule of thumb for me is like, I guess I don't have a rule of thumb, maybe about a month. And then uh, you wanna pin them before they've been in there for that long. Um, if you take them out after a month and you see that, and, and when they thaw, they're, they're, they're not flexible anymore, that means that they're too dry to pin. But you can fix that, and it's uh, actually a pretty easy fix. You can take something like, let me go grab one more thing. You can take something like a big bowl and put some water in here. And then get a piece of styrofoam and float that on the water and then set your bugs that have become dry and brittle on that and just leave them there for a few hours. It really doesn't take very long and they'll actually become humid just from the humidity of the water in the bowl. Let's show this again. So let's pretend there's water in there and this and the styrofoam is floating on the water and you've got your, your butterflies and grasshoppers that have become too dry on there and it sort of rehydrates them and allows you to, um, to pin them. When, they when their legs start to become flexible again, you know that it's okay to pin them and they won't fall apart and become too dry. Um, oh, a lot of times also uh, people will come up to us and they'll have bugs that they've collected many, many months ago that they didn't put in the freezer. They just caught them and, they just, and the bugs just died in the, in the, in the jar. Uh, and they become brittle. And you can do the same thing. Even if they haven't been in the freezer, you can do the same thing. You can set them on the styrofoam on top of water and they'll rehydrate. Um, and like I said, it usually just takes a couple hours. So that's how to get started. Going outside, collecting bugs, put them in the, put them in the freezer. The next step is to take the bugs out of the freezer and unfreeze them. That usually doesn't take very long. They'll unfreeze in just a few minutes. And then, like I said, if they'd only been in the freezer for a, for a week or two or a few days, they'll still be flexible. Their bodies will be nice and flexible. Let me show you here. I've got some some dead bugs and these bugs have been dead for a long time but ooh, I'll, oh I'll put it up with the white behind you can still see this bug's been dead for years but its antenna are still flexible this one's actually been stored in alcohol instead of a freezer but this is this but a bug that's just been frozen for a few weeks will look the same as this it will be very flexible, and this means that you can put a pin through it without it crumbling and falling apart. If a bug becomes too dry and you try to put a pin through it, it will crumble and fall apart like a potato chip. It'll just, it'll just fall apart. But when a bug is still fresh and flexible, it can actually, it's actually fairly tough. So you unfreeze the bugs and pin them in the proper place. I'm gonna try to, like I said, do a separate video on this later because this camera isn't good for this, but I am gonna show you one one time how to pin things. So this is a beetle. This is, uh, and it belongs to its own order called Coleoptera. The way I pin a bug is I grip it between my two fingers of my off hand. So this is my left hand. And then I get a pin 
in my right hand. For beetles, the pin for them goes, ooh, I can actually get fairly close there. The pin goes through one side of their, um, of their back. So they have two wing covers called elytra. There's one on the right side and one on the left side. The pin for beetles goes through the right side. And so I wanna make it to where the pin is perpendicular at a right angle with the body of the insect. Push it straight through there and then push the bug almost to the top of the pin, but not quite to the top. It needs about, oh, a quarter inch or so at the top so you can grip it and move it around. And then the most of the pin is down here, as you can see. You can see the bug is at a right angle with the rest of it. So we've got a bug there. And then the pin went through. This image is actually uh, correct. So it shows the right side of the beetle, and that's where the pin went through. So just to show you a couple of different angles there. And then my next step would be, if I'm satisfied with how my beetle looks, I can just put it straight into my white insect box. But if I wanted to do some things to it, like maybe uh, make its legs look a certain way, I can take my pinning board, I can put it maybe here on the edge, and then I can use other pins to move its legs around. Remember, its legs are flexible right now, and they'll, they'll eventually dry into place wherever, you, wherever they dry. So I can move them around to how I want that beetle to look. I can spread its legs out and make it look a little bit nicer. Tweezers are also helpful with this. So you see how I'm spreading its legs out, spreading its antenna out, and then I'll put some pins there to sort of hold them into place. Try to get a little closer. I'm putting pins around its body. This is, there's too much white on this, so it's hard to see, but as, like I said, I'll try to do a separate video for this. I'm putting pins around its body to hold its legs into where I want them to be. Wherever its, wherever its legs and antenna dry into position, it's, it's how it's gonna look for the next several hundred years until it's broken. So we wanna pick a position that we want it to look nice in, so we can see those body parts. After a few days, once it's once the bug is dried into place, we can then take these pins away, and now the bug will be ready to label and move wherever we want it to go. So those are some of our next steps. Um, then you want to label the bugs with 4-H labels. So what we see on here on this slide are properly pinned and labeled bugs. They have one label that shows where and when they were collected and um, the name of the 4 h that actually collected them. Those go um, in line or parallel with the insect's body, and that label actually goes closer to the insect's body. And I showed you these labels a second ago, where they come from, but I'll show you again. Um, these are downloadable off of our website, but you need to print them on cardstock. Um, so the little label that has the date and place and who collected it, those are on here. So you'll write those out with pencil. This person actually filled them out on the computer, which is also okay to do if you want to do it that way, but it still needs to be printed on cardstock. So that's the date, the time, and the name of the person. And then that label goes on the pin closest to the bug because it's more important. It's the most important label. And then there's another label called the common name label. And when you know the common name of the, of the bug, you can write that down and that goes underneath and that one goes perpendicular. So these all show sort of the proper orientation. And then the name of the order goes on top of all the bugs that, have, that are in the same order and they all go in a column. And I'll show you the, the, the box layout here in a minute as well. So that's a little bit about how unfreezing the bugs, pinning them, labeling them, and arranging the boxes go. And this is what a proper box arrangement looks like. Um, this document might not be uh, available on our website. If you want a copy of this picture, this can be a really handy picture, so please let me know. This, this um, sheet isn't really meant to help with identification. All the bugs on here are identified correctly, uh, but this is just a fraction of the creatures that you can find out there. Um, but what it shows you is proper box orientation for this project. Once again, this is a step you'll worry about maybe in uh, you know the week before uh, you turn this in for county fair. The most important stuff is collecting the bugs. Um, this is all stuff you do at the end. But this shows you that all the bugs are arranged by order. So all the beetles that this person found, and they found five of them, 
they put them under the label that says Coleoptera, which is beetles. Let me show you just a, once again what the sort of the real version of that looks like as well. So we've got the order label up here, and remember the order labels are on our website. You print them out on cardstock, you cut them out. These are the Lepidoptera. In this case, they put the Lepidoptera first, and the Lepidoptera label is up here, and they put all their moths and butterflies, because all moths and butterflies go in Lepidoptera, and they go in a straight column down. And then when you're done with the butterflies and moths, you start with the next order, in the, in the, and then you continue the column. In this case, and this is all these, these rules about how the box is arranged are all in the documents, by the way. And ask me, if you, ask me on email if you have questions about them, too. Then this person, they only had one roach, and so they decided to, to finish this column by putting Blatteria, which is the order that roaches belong to, and they put their one roach there. Then they started the next column, which is Coleoptera, or beetles, and they put all their beetles in. So um, this box is arranged very similarly to the one on the picture. They don't have to be arranged exactly the same way. You can put the orders sort of wherever you want to, however they fit the best. But they all need to be arranged in columns. Another rule that you'll see in the document is that the, the biggest bugs in each order go first. So you see up here, this, this big beetle is the first one, and then they descend in size. Same thing over here. We started with Hymenoptera, which is the bees, ants, and wasps, and we went from this really big carpenter bee down in size, down to this little, looks like a yellow jacket. Same thing with these flies. We would start with the biggest fly and then down. So that's how the box is arranged and oriented. So for identification, what the 4-H'ers need to do with each of their bugs is identify which order it belongs to. So we just showed you that, and the orders are arranged in columns. Um, you can find multiple examples of each order, but we don't want more than one of the same species. So for example, Coleoptera is a really good order to get. That's all the beetles. But don't put in more than one Japanese beetle because you won't get points for that. You can put it in if you want to, it just won't get points. Duplicate bugs uh, don't get points. But if you find 10 Coleoptera, that would be really great. What you get for that is you get 10 points for the order, Coleoptera, and then one additional point for one additional point for each new member you put in there. And if you think about that math a little bit, that makes you realize that the more orders the better because you get 10 points per order. So if you if you say had a whole bunch of beetles, but then you just had one uh, uh, termite. Termites have their own order. Make sure that termite gets put in there because that's a, that's another 10 points just for having any termites in there. So that we want lots of orders. The orders really um, add to the diversity of your collection and also the points. A first year collection must have at least four orders. And by the way, there's about 25 total orders that you'll find in Kentucky. So a first year collection has to have at least four orders and then those number of orders that you have to have go up in the second, third, and third year collection and so forth. And then more orders get you more points, like I said. Then for common name, um, common name isn't as important and common names are not scientific. They're just something, uh, an additional way to help us to identify bugs. Common names are optional for first year, but they do add points. So for instance, if you had, uh, once again, if you had that termite, you get 10 points because you've included an isoptera, which is its own order. You get one point for having that termite in there. And then if you call it a, um, a termite, which is its common name, you get one additional point. So that right there you have 12, 12 points. Um, and so that's how the points can add up for this. So we, we encourage first year uh, 4-H'ers to do a common name for each bug, but they don't have to. Also, they could maybe just do uh, common names for some of the bugs. They don't have to do it for all of them. And then in, in uh, second, third year, I believe um, so many of them have to have the common names identified. Some more identification help. Um, we showed you the, um, the guide to common insect orders that you can print off for free. And like I said, there's also that online version as well. But there's a lot of other identification resources out there as well. One of the ones we really like is Bug Guide. Let me show you what Bug Guide looks like. So if you just type in Bug Guide on Google, It'll take you straight to it. Bug guide is nice because it's arranged by insect order. Um, these things are the, some of the different orders. So these two up here, moths and butterflies, they'll take you straight to them. There's also flies, dragonflies, mantids, which are their own order. 
roaches, and etc. So you click on one of those, you have a creature, you're not quite sure what it is, but you think, well, I think it kind of looks like a fly. So I'm going to go to the fly section, and you can just start working through there after that. Um, there's actually thousands and thousands of pictures on here, so it sometimes can be hard to find an exact match to what you're looking for. But if you have patience, eventually you can usually find um, the creature you're looking for. Some other resources um, is our, our field guides. Um, I'll show you my favorite field guide that's currently around. This is called the National Wildlife Federation Field Guide to Insects and Spiders of North America. It's got this big green mantis on it. It's by Arthur Evans. Um, I really like this one because for one thing, um, it has almost, it doesn't have every bug that you'll find in Kentucky. That would be impossible. We have about 15,000 species in Kentucky. No book has all of them. Um, this only has about a thousand species in it and um and also this covers the whole united states so it doesn't have every kentucky bug but what it does tend to have is examples of the kinds of bugs that you'll find in kentucky so um it might not show every kind of stink bug that we have but it'll show the two or three different kinds that you're most likely to find um and the other thing i like about it is it's arranged by insect order in fact if you look at the top of the the, the um the pages they're color coded and it's all arranged by order. So professional entomologists use insect orders too. That's why we do it, this project this way. Um, the, the border at the top, they're color coded and they're arranged by order. So for instance, this whole section that's kind of brownish orange, this is the beetles or order coleoptera, shows a whole bunch of different beetles, including a lot of the ones that you're gonna find in Kentucky. It gives you common names. It also talks about the family names. Um, one uh, word of advice, um, Sometimes you can use the kind of the family name of a bug as its common name. Let me try to give you an example here. Click, here's a click beetle. So click beetles are super common in Kentucky. I'm trying to get it so that you can see it on the camera. Actually, I'm gonna go ahead and increase the size of this. If I can. Okay, so click beetle. Let's look at this brown click beetle here. We have a lot of click beetles in Kentucky that look like this. Sort of brown. A click beetle is kind of a flat brown beetle, and they click when you put them in your hand. They're really cool creatures, super common to find. This one happens to be called the luminescent click beetle. It says Arizona. It says its range, and look at the range on these things whenever you're looking up a bug. Arizona east to Georgia and Florida south of New Mexico. That's probably a little too far south for us. So we don't have this exact creature in Kentucky, or at least I've never seen it. We might have it. I'm not sure. But we sure do have a lot of brown click beetles that look like this. So what a 4 h might possibly do is look into the sky and see a brown click beetle, and they'll say, oh, I've got the luminescent click beetle, and they'll write that on their common name. But they might not have the luminescent click beetle. But what they might have is a click beetle, because there's lots of click beetles. So if you see, if they see something, and this whole page is full of different kinds of click beetles, by the way. Notice how they all have the same shape. If you see something like this, and you're not quite sure if it's this exact creature, look at the common name, and it says click beetles. Click beetles. They all say click beetles. That's a great common name that you can use uh, for some of these things. Another example would be um, Japanese beetle. Let's say you find something that kind of looks like a Japanese beetle, but you're not quite sure if it's a Japanese beetle. Maybe it, the color isn't quite right or it seems a little bit too big. Instead of writing Japanese beetle down there and, and being uh, maybe possibly wrong about it, Japanese beetles and their relatives, which all kind of look the same, belong to the same family called the scarab beetle family. So instead of calling it a Japanese beetle, if you're not sure, call it a scarab beetle. You're more likely to have the right answer. Um, okay, so some other um, tools that you can use include um, the Kentucky Critter Files. Let me show you that website. So um, Bug Guide has insects from around the United States. It has thousands of pictures. It's the best online resource for identifying insects from around the country. But for Kentucky, we have something called the Kentucky Critter Files. And this is something that's just for Kentucky. It doesn't have nearly as many creatures in it. And it doesn't include, I mean, by far, it doesn't include all the creatures that we have in Kentucky but it helps narrow down to some of the very most common ones. So you see it's, it's arranged by insects, and these 
things here where it says dragonflies, mayflies, stoneflies, crickets, and so forth. These are the orders. This is arranged by orders. It's got spiders too, but for the but for the entomology project, we really want to focus on insects. So if you if you click on to beetles, it'll take you to some different groups of beetles. And by the way, once again, these are these are common names you can use. So if you find a ground beetle, you're not sure exactly which kind of ground beetle it is, but you're pretty sure it's a ground beetle, just call it a ground beetle. You don't have to have the exact common name. You can just have it in the right group, and that'll get you some points. So it shows you the life cycle and some pictures of common, um, common ground beetles. So those are resources that we have. And then, like I said, we have um, my email address. Uh, if you have a photo, uh, if you have a bug, you're not sure what it is, whether it's whether you take the picture of it alive or dead, try to get a good close-up picture of it um, with your um, cell phone and send it to my email address and I'll try to identify it. Usually I can get to that within a day or two. So let's do an identification example. I think we'll, we're going to try to do a whole separate video that goes into more detail about how to identify some of these things. But let's get started with an example. So if you catch one of these things, which is super common in Kentucky in the summer, Hopefully the first thing you think is, ah, that is a grasshopper. And you're right, it is a grasshopper. But we need to know what order it belongs to. So um, there are several different ways to find out which order it belongs to. Um, one of the easiest ways, like I said, is to use our guide to insect orders. Flip to page nine and then start going down through the list. Is it a springtail? That's the first order. That's the Columbula order. Well, they're tiny insects that they do hop, but they don't look very much like grasshoppers. I'm gonna skip that one. I'm gonna go to silverfish. There are these things with three long tails. That doesn't look right. I'll go past mayflies. That doesn't look right. So you sort of do a process of elimination until you get to what looks like the right answer. And it's pretty easy with these because it's the orthoptera order which is grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. So it's got pictures of some grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids there. They're all, they all have some things in common. They all have these big jumping legs like we see on our grasshopper. Most of them have wings. A lot of them are green or brown because they live uh, outdoors, want to be camouflaged. So that's the right answer for this. It's order, orthoptera, and the common name for this, hopefully you've already guessed it, it's just grasshopper. If you wanted to get more detailed than that, um, this one happens to be a short-horned grasshopper. That's what family it belongs to. And then the exact species it is, I don't even know. I have no idea what the exact species of this is. Uh, for one thing, it's been kind of cartoonized, so it might not be possible to tell what the exact species is. But we don't have. But for this project, we don't have to know the exact species. We need to know the order and the common name, and a lot of times you can find that pretty easy. So there's just an example of how we do um, identification. So it's order, orthoptera, common name, grasshopper. Uh, building your box. So some of you might get your box uh, unassembled. I think a lot of your agents are going ahead and assembling these for you. But in case you get them unassembled, I'll show you again. This is what the complete box looks like. The unassembled box comes in three parts. It comes in three sheets. It comes in sort of a short sheet, a longer sheet, and a piece of styrofoam. The way you put these together is you look around the box until you find the side that has where the creases are the most obvious. So on this side it has some creases, but a lot of it looks very shiny and flat. We don't want to fold it on that side because that'll ruin it. We want to go to the side that has lots of obvious creases in it and then start folding it in. We fold these two sides in. We take these flaps and fold them in. Then we fold this side in two, we press it down to create a lip right here. And we go around to the other side, flip that down, fold that one over too, and they press down into the little slots. So it actually goes pretty quickly. And then I believe this is the bottom half. So we take our styrofoam piece that's, that's made to be the exact size of this and just shove it down in there. Usually they fit really, really well. And you can shove them straight down in there and they they stay there forever. If for some reason it's bowed in the middle or it seems a little too small, get some heavy duty double sided tape. You can get, it's, I think it's called double sided carpet tape. You can get it at places like um, Home Depot or Amazon and put a couple of big strips of that down and slap, slap that on there and that'll hold it down really well. Then we 
Then we have our lid piece as well. Works basically the same way. Find the side that has the, the sharp creases on all edges. So the other side, the creases are not obvious. They're smooth. So we take it, fold these two sides up, fold these flaps in, fold it down to make the lip here. Same thing on the other side. Fold it down. Now we've got our lid. Sometimes there are stray pieces of cardboard that can just be thrown off. The lid fits very snugly onto the top of the, the bottom piece. It's meant to be super snug so that it's tough in the mail. These are meant to be mailed. Um, and uh, they, they don't open very easily. Also, um, so for this 4-H project, you, know, you might notice some documentation that says there's an option to just to submit your project in a wooden box. Um, that's perfect, and the wooden boxes have glass tops. Those are perfectly fine to do. There's no difference in points, like if you turn it in a cardboard box or a wooden box, there's no difference in the amount of points you get. The difference is, if you're very interested in displaying it on a wall in your house when it gets done, the glass box, the wooden box with the glass lid is really nice. If you're more interested in storing it like on a bookshelf, like if I was gonna store it back there, this is better. It's cheaper and it's more durable. I can drop this even with insects in it, and it's not going to shatter, and a lot of times the insects will survive as well. If I dropped a wooden box with a glass lid on the ground, the whole box could shatter, and then your insects would get damaged too. So we really like these wooden um, cardboard boxes. So that's how to put the, put the box together. Um, some collecting tips that I have for you. Try to move this around a little bit again. Um, get started collecting before you fully understand all this. I know we've just gone through this video. There's a whole lot of rules and, and little things that you need to do, but get started before you understand the rules. You already know that there's bugs outside. Uh, you've, you've probably already caught bugs in your life before for different reasons. So just go out, collect bugs, get a lot of different kinds. Try to find as many different kinds as you can. Think about beetles, grasshoppers, stink bugs, stick bugs, mantids, flies. Ants, all kinds of different things. The more different than they look, the better. Um, a little bit about spiders and other things that aren't quite insects. Um, for one thing, earthworms don't go in the collection at all. The only things you can, in, can include in this collection are insects and their very close relatives like spiders, centipedes, and millipedes. Um, you can include spiders and centipedes and millipedes, things like that that aren't, they aren't insects. You can include them and there's actually a spot for them um, you'll notice on this sheet, let me get this real close here, there's, you see up here where it says classes? If you find an, a spider or a, um, a roly-poly, which would go under crustacea, or a millipede that would go under diplopoda, or a centipede, which would go under chylopoda, go ahead and use these labels instead of the order labels, and go ahead and include that, especially if you can pin it and make it look kind of nice, and you'll still get points for it. Um, Generally, though, we want to emphasize insects because there's more orders of insects, they're more common, um, they're more important economically, and uh, they tend to do better in these collections. A lot of things like millipedes and centipedes and spiders, their bodies are softer and they don't, they don't do as well in a pin. They kind of tend to droop and fall apart. But if you can get one that's pinned nicely, go ahead and put it in there. But the real emphasis on this collection is insects. Oh, another thing is um, this collection is for is adults only. It's only, uh, we only want to include adult insects. Um, for the photography project and actually for the, um, some of the later pin projects, the second, third, and fourth year and so forth, there's options, there's opportunities to include um, insect larvae. Um, but not for this, not for first year. For first year pin collections, we just want you to do adult insects. So no caterpillars. Um, no maggots. Those things do not do well on pins. They have to be stored in alcohol, and this collection is not very good uh, for that. What, what alcohol is, is, we, is not alcohol that you buy at the, at the, at the grocery store. Uh, it's um, alcohol that puts, gets put into a bottle. It's, it's chemical grade alcohol. You actually can buy it at the pharmacy. It's, you use 70% ethanol. It's actually a good way to store insects if you want to store them in this way instead of the freezer. Um, and you can use these vial stored insects for later collections. I think fourth year might actually require some of this, but for first year collection, we just want pinned adult insects. So get started.
Don't worry if you can't identify the insects yet. Just collect lots of different kinds. Go outside to a warm, sunny location with lots of plants, lots of weeds, lots of flowers, a garden, um, cornfields, something like that. One rule of thumb is the more different kinds of flowers and plants that you see, the more different kinds of insects will be there. If you're in a place where the insects are really buzzing around you and it's sunny, you're in the right place. Get lots of bugs, sort them, and identify them later. All right, so I covered a whole bunch of stuff in this video. Like I said, this is just an introduction. We're gonna try to have some follow-up videos that have things like um, more details on how to pin the bugs, more details on how to use this thing that we call the spreading board. Um, and we'll, we'll try to do one whole video that's just identification. Use my email address, like I said right here, to help you with identification. And, um, and then like I said, we'll also try to have a separate video just for how to do the insect photography project. Um, so if you have any questions in the meantime, please send them to me and good luck. Get out there and collect. We'll talk to you later.